What kind of man are you raising your son to be? Join us today on the Brave Talk Show with our special guest, Rhonda Stoppy, to learn how to hand your son his manhood. Hey, brave girl, how you do the things that you do? Hi everyone, welcome to The Brave Talk Show, the show for brave women craving the connection that comes with real conversations about the concerns and TMI details we face every day. We're your hosts, I'm Teresa. I'm Robin. I'm Brittany. And I'm Vanessa. Be sure to subscribe to join our weekly conversations. Today, we are talking about raising our sons to be men. But Love first, yes. we have our hot topic. Oops, and she Robin, did it again. I'm gonna let you do this. Oops, I did it again. What are we talking about? Free Britney. Free Britney. Free Britney, you guys. I'm in the free Britney camp. Me too. Free her. Okay. <laughs> Hit me, I'm baby, so one more time. Come on. Are, are you guys part of the free Britney camp? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I was gonna make a poster and then I was up there. Sorry about that. Oh, that would have been hilarious. It's a poster. <laughs> okay. Very pretty. Okay, so I didn't research it until a couple weeks ago when you guys when Robin brought it up and I spent like a whole night just scrolling my Instagram and reading all these news articles and I was like, Oh my god. Okay, right? so before it's like come to the news in the past like couple months. There has been a following of people, myself included, Me for too. the past years. That she, so she has her Instagram, mm -hmm. but and I there's heard a it's not really her Instagram. Somebody else runs it. Well, there's been some things like not. It's not controversy. But the thing that you're talking conspiracy. about, conservatorship. Con conspiracy. No, 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 no. no. Oh, conspiracy. 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 Yes. conspiracy. Yes. So she would like say things that like, if I blink twice, my dad, or like if I. She had, there was like these little secret little codes that like stuff, yeah. little hints like my dad's keeping me hostage with a yellow rose and then the next day her she's like dancing with a yellow rose it's on like her, her Instagram. Her behaviors were just like mm -hmm. very, like very like erratic. And so before yeah. this has come out everyone yeah. was like she's trapped in her own house because she would say these type of things like these little clues and now it's actually come out that truly she is actually the, being completely controlled. What's her thing they did on Hulu like if you watch it is impressive it's like what? This poor girl. Her so is it like a documentary? Documentary on, it's like, free, is it Free Britney, free Britney. or just Britney? Uh, I think I'm it's just sure. Britney. But they and control everything. Her money, everything. she can't, she, uh, they took away, her dad took away her driver's license. Birth control. Because they put an IUD in her. On her. She yep. can't have a baby. I was watching something last night that it was footage of her last music video. It was like a very sexual scene. And there was like mm -hmm. all these guys grinding on her. And she didn't and want And she that. was screaming, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. And they were like he her literally do it. control every aspect of her life, mm -hmm. like everything. And the thing that's kind of like, what judge? Because the judge keep ordering this, and I say like, what? This is a grown woman. Yes, does she have a mental health? Sure. Like, yeah. Sure. sure. Can we help get her a team that can help her because she has the money? But to take a grown man, her mm -hmm. dad. That's like a this. It's like a level of abusiveness behind it. It's like this man is like her IUD. Are you kidding me? Like I know. taking away he, her license. Her license. Because she everything? got in, she got pulled over. She didn't get a ticket. She got pulled over for going ten miles over, and her dad said, "You don't deserve to drive yeah. anymore." And so took away her. Here's license. what I've been reading. I've been reading that the judge is being paid. That's one of the conspiracy theories oh. is that the judge is being paid. That's why it keeps, they keep reinstating it. Mm -hmm. um, another thing that I read that I thought was really interesting was if you look at all of the male actors who have had similar or, or worse yeah. behavior, they just got a slap on the hand and, go. and then freedom. Mm -hmm. Whereas a female who did this, look at what has been taken from her and it like the male counterpart if a yeah. male had done that same thing. Yeah. And I feel like if Nothing. you go back on her life, we're like, oh, it makes sense. It makes, like, it makes absolute, absolute sense. sense why she was acting. She was trying to scream for attention because I feel like for a long time, I don't think she could talk about it. We probably probably did an NDA too. and all this yeah. stuff like that. Well, you know, back in 2007 yeah. when she shaved her head, like I think that was just we all scream. think it's, oh, it's the fame and the money. It's her psycho dad, dad. Yeah. controlling but, her but life. But that was the good news. The judge just allow her to get her own lawyer mm -hmm. so then she's like yeah. ready and i think which is a great thing because it's like it's how is she not going to be represented like mm -hmm. you her dad is after her but you're not going to let her get a legal representation yeah. Yeah. like let the girl take a neuropsych no neuropsych an assessment yes she has a mental yeah but the dad gotta go i remember like years ago probably like 20 years ago like watching some article that was like breaking news we think that britney spears dad is controlling her and 
ever since she was a mouseketeer, he forced her into this and like mm. pushed this on her. Like that was like literally 20 years ago. Long, like yeah. I remember hearing that, that mm -hmm. like her dad was always forcing her into the showbiz to make the money for the family and making her do all these things. And a lot of sexual things, a lot of, the, or there was one man who was really close to her and was like her bodyguard or something like that. Mm. And he said from a young age, she would be like, I don't want to go to that shoot. I don't want to do that music video. Mm -hmm. And they knew that sex sold. Yeah, and so they, they made her do those type of things when they, she was just yeah. a teenage girl. And how is this, honestly, if you really think about that, how is this any different than the sex trafficking and right. slave? Like, there's so much similarities. Mm -hmm. It's really horrible. She's and the fact being that trafficked right in her own family. Our very in eyes. public. Yeah, yeah, and in front of public eye. Nobody, yeah. because we thought, like, oh, this is weird. I don't think anybody really put it together. Yeah. Like, she was doing a now. cry for help until and now. I, it's I, like, I honestly oh. don't think she put it together. Mm -mm. Like, well, I think I read that. Because most of the Yeah. That it was even wrong or that she could even fight it like until right. about like a year ago that she started like wait a second I can say no to this like, yeah I, I mean and you you hear that like when people are getting abused yep. by their own family they, oh, yeah. they don't even realize it till later because that's just it's it, she's been in fame mm -hmm. since a, a toddler yeah. mm -hmm. and like this has been her life and she probably has loved you know being famous and stuff too so she's probably like there's a that catch 22 fun. if yeah. I start fighting against this then I might lose do this. I lose all this but I think I think when she was a teen and a kid, we all understood, oh yeah, her dad has to, you know, kind of control it, things, yeah. manage it. But now she's a grown adult, grown adult, and she can't make these decisions. And it makes that's you think abusive. like your surrounding, like where are your friends, where are your family, where are other people? Yeah, so that's my question, what about her boyfriend? She has yeah, a serious she had, boyfriend, yeah. like, what? where is he? Why isn't he saying anything? I was reading something that like, she can't be with her boyfriend or other friends without someone observing her. What? I didn't yeah. read that. Like some of her like uh, dancing um, backup dancers say that like literally someone will always be in the room listening and watching. That's so sad. Jeez, that's yeah. So sad. Uh -oh. So look, we all for free Britney, right? Yes. We're all free. Britney. I'm all Team free Britney. Free Britney. Free Britney. Yes. So free let us her. know what you guys think. Have you been following it all? Let us know what your thoughts are on that. Um, if you don't know anything about conservatorship. Conservatorship? That's the yeah. first time I even knew that this existed. I had no idea that this was even something either. that existed. Or was possible. So now I'm interested in knowing what other people what are celebrities. Stuck in these. Well, yeah, celebrities. Yeah. 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 Kanye yeah. West said that it was happening to him that uh, the, the Kardashians yeah, the were starting that's to why. do that to do him, that and that's why he left. Shot. If you become a brand, uh, and then they like, try when he was starting to speak up because he was releasing some stuff that he shouldn't have been saying because we all were like, what? Uh -huh. And then the minute that they tried to flew to his um, ranch, and he was like, mm -mm, you guys are not coming. They wanted to be the doctors, the lawyers, and everything. He said what was happening to Britney was going to happen to him. Happened to him because shut they up. were going to try to come and shut her down, and he shut him down, and he was like, mm -mm, not yep. happening. So yep. it may be happening. We just More don't know. More than we think. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Today we have our very first virtual guest, my favorite, Rhonda Stoppy, with more than 30 years experience of helping women build no regrets lives. She's the author of six books, almost all of which I've read personally, I love them so much, and she's appeared on numerous radio programs, including Focus on the Family, Family Life Today, and Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk, and she hosts the No Regrets Hour. Rhonda Stoppy, we are so excited to have you on today. Yeah. I'm so happy. I wish I was I wish I was physically with you right now to give you each a great big hug, but I'm so glad that I'm able to be with you from my office in California. And welcome. Wonderful welcome. to have you. Now, I know you read you've written six books, but we have you on specifically today because all of us ladies here are moms. Um, I believe every one of us have, we boys. have boys. We all yeah. have boys. All boys. Um, we have some girls too, but we, you know, we're we're raising boys as well. And you have written this book that we we just love so much called Raising Boys to Be Men. Moms raising boys to be men. And we would just love your insight. But the first thing that I really want to know is why did you write this book? What was the issue that you saw that made you go, I need to write this book? Mm -hmm. Such a good question. So Moms Raising Sons to Be Men is from my heart. I've raised two sons and two daughters. My oldest son, Tony, did not come to our family till he was 15. Uh, so I talk about how he became our son in the book also. But here's where the book came from. I speak at homeschool conventions. I speak at women's events, at mops, at all kinds of things. And when I spoke at a homeschool convention, on Moms Raising Sons to Be Men, it was standing room only and women standing around with just tears flowing mm. as I talked about how adolescent sons will push their moms away and 
my son and I, Brandon, Brandon's a worship pastor. He was in Southern California and uh, he just got a job up closer to home. We're so glad he and his family are going to live near us. But we just did a uh, mother's son retreat at Mount Hermon and Brandon talked to the moms. And one of the things Brandon said when he was talking about adolescence, he said, when I when my mom stopped crying, I knew I had lost control. And I mean, these moms are like leaning in and hanging on his every word because, you know, that mother son relationship it's mysterious. It's sweet. And then they start pushing us away. And moms are like, oh, no. So there's a section in Moms Raising Sons that it says control freaks raise freaks. Because what we do is we try to control <laughs> them to still be that sweet, precious little boy. And, and they're not. And the harder we squeeze, the more they push us away. So that's the heart of Moms Raising Sons to be men is to help women guide their sons towards a no regrets life from biblical moms in scripture that are just real women that did their time in history, just like we're doing ours from women that I have learned from stories of um, St. Augustine's mother and um, John Wesley's mother, Spurgeon's mother, Billy Graham's mother, just like amazing moms that have blessed our generations by raising sons that made an impact. Mm -hmm. And I think all of us as moms, you know, we want to do our best. I mean, how many of us lay in bed at night and we say to ourselves, I'm going to be a better mom tomorrow. Mm -hmm. and, and why that just made me cry. It's so <laughs> I know ladies, I'm there for you. I get it. I remember I had postpartum after my third child. I had um, not just PMS. I had um, PMD, I had a hormonal imbalance. Um, and I remember feeling alone. I remember not knowing what to do to be the mom I had hoped I would be. And I looked around and I found women whose kids liked them. And I'm like, tell me what you know. And that's, you know, the Bible says Titus to the women, the older women are to teach the younger how to love their husbands and love their children. And that's why my books are about having a better marriage, being the mom you hoped you would be, having the ma marriage you long to have. Um, and that's where this book comes from. Mm. I love wow. that. Teach me all the things. I know. I yeah. got emotional just listening Teach to you. Teach me yeah. all the things. I have two little boys, one-year-old and three-year-old, and they are so sweet. You're telling me they're going to push away? No. Yes, they She's going to help you so they don't push you away. Okay. okay. You're never well, going to experience Here's the reality. That. This is the bottom line. There is no coming of man ritual in our culture. I wish we could have them go walk on hot coals, pee on a rock, kill the fatted calf, let's have a party, you're a man. Mm -hmm. We don't have that. What we do have in our culture is don't be a mama's boy. And our sons start pushing us away. You'll know when it, it's happening. They'll start smelling funky. Mm -hmm. They'll start having an attitude. That floor that they swept for however long, all of a sudden it's beneath them. And you're looking, you're trying to define that as rebellion. But mm -hmm. if we understand men, they crave respect. And when they work, they want to do something that earns respect, that they can respect themselves for, that other men will respect them for, that we will respect them for. And honestly, you and I know that floor is going to need swept again tomorrow. We just do it. Or if you're like me, you let the dog in and they clean up all that stuff. <laughs> but when your son starts saying, oh, I don't want to do it, we have to recognize the signs. They're, they're wanting to be a man. So my, I always tell moms, either you hand your son his manhood or he will fight you for it. So that's what Moms Raising Sons talks about. From the time they're one and two little guys, how we set the stage so that when they reach that season of their life, I always say that the difference between a toddler and a teen is diaper rash and acne. They, whatever we want to establish when they're little, like it's going to visit us when they're adolescent. So if we're not teaching them to respect us, if we're not teaching them to be kind, um, that's going to come back. And boy, the arguments that your adolescent has are far more painful because they know what to say to get your heart, right? Yeah. Oh, I do. You know, I remember with my son, my, um, I have a 14 year old and I remember, I, I don't know why it was one of those mom instinct nights. He used to, when he was a child, when he was a boy, he loved for me every night to when it was time for bedtime to come and crawl into the bed with him and and rub my fingers down his back like this, you know, just kind of up and down. And he would just lay there and we would talk and I would just stroke my fingers down his back and until he fell asleep. And it was a very special thing that I had with my son. And I remember one night he was 11 years old 
and he he called me into his room to to tuck him in and i i remember i just knew it in my heart i got into that and i started stroking his back and i'm like this is the last time that he's going to call mm. me into his into the room i just knew it i could feel it so i'm so thankful that i did because i was right it was the last time i don't know god instinct whatever i don't know what it was and how i knew but when i was stroking his back that night knowing it was my last time i just breathed in the smell of his hair and you know the back of his neck and just embraced it and it's been such a a, a, a wonderful memory for me um, because that was I think that last like real precious mommy son moment that I got to have with him and we've had different ones since then but they just look different mm -hmm. you know they look different and we're uh, all crying <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh, you're so, right. The auditorium see, was filled with crying women. You can see. Okay, so I have some amazing stories to connect all that you just said, Teresa. Okay, please share. So my son, Brandon, we had moved to Austin, Texas. We planted a church there. Um, we met in our home, 200 teenagers in our house every Wednesday night. And these kids were coming to Christ. They'd grown up in the Bible Belt. They didn't understand who Jesus really was. They just knew about the religion of Christianity. Mm -hmm. And while that was happening, my son developed seizures, severe epilepsy. Mm -hmm. He had a seizure. It was 28 minutes long. Steve was in California still. I was in Texas by myself. The helicopter came. The police came. They life flighted him to the um, hospital. He had a 28 minute seizure. Oh, wow. Yes. And so when we got to the hospital, they did EEGs on his little brain. They glue these little things to their head and they're, you know, was trying to do a sleep study. They had him sleep at one point. And this is the interesting part. When he fell asleep, six years old, adorable little guy, I went over and I gave him a little kiss on his temple. And the tech called me over. And now this is in the olden days, in the 1900s, when it wasn't digital, it was actually reading out on a piece of paper. And she took her marker and she circled and she wrote mom's kiss. We're all going to cry again. She said, he knows you kissed him when he was sleeping. Aww. Isn't that precious? That is precious. And, and so I... I want you to know when my kids reach junior high, all of them, my daughters, my sons, and they start like, you know, eh, come on, mom. I would go in and kiss them on their temple at night when they were sleeping. And I would tell them in their little ears, I love you. Mommy loves you so much. I kind of brainwashed them while they were <laughs> unconscious. <laughs> you love mommy. <laughs> but when Brandon was older, I would back give him a back scratch because no one will resist a back scratch. And I'm not talking about laying in the bed next to him and snuggles like that, Teresa, but just scratching his back. And I always did that. That's how, even with my, my uh, adolescent daughters, that's how I would connect with them or tickle their arms. So after Brandon got married, I remember they came to visit and he's married to a precious woman back there expecting their fourth child. And it, well, they weren't married for too long and he came to visit. And then he said, you know, mama, you can still scratch my back. Mm. And I'm like, okay, because you're trying to find your place as the mom of the son who's married now. And I was really blessed that he said that because if he wouldn't have said it, I would have been like, that's her place now. And then I have to tell one more story that connects all these dots. In um, Moms Raising Sons to Be Men, I tell the story about Brandon. When he was in kindergarten, he was on stage and it was a Christmas program. He had his little red cardigan sweater singing in his heart out. And I whistle really loud. And we live on a ranch, an 80 acre ranch in the middle of nowhere. So my kids, when they heard mom's whistle, they knew it was time to come home. And whenever my son would sing or be on stage, any of my kids, I would whistle real loud. And so when he was done with his song, I whistled and he looked and found me and winked at me. Aww. And for all of Brandon's life, as he has been on stages, he's played, he's toured with Shane and Shane and Matthew West and casting crowns. He's um, just had some awesome opportunities. But whenever I'm at an event or at a church where he's leading worship and there's an applause, I whistle. And he always <laughs> looks until he finds his mama and he'll wink at me. <laughs> Isn't that sweet? So That's sweet. there's a, a woman in Nashville, Brandon and Jesse were living in Nashville and they were, um, he was playing in a church and a woman uh, texted me that she had been reading my book and she was sitting behind Jesse, his Brandon's wife, and she could see the back of Jesse's head and she could see Brandon on stage. She took a picture and she sent it to me, which as your kids get older, older, the glimpses of them are so sweet when they don't live near you. And all she texted me was, he winks at her now. Oh. Yeah, right? But 
that's what we want. We want to launch them into men that transfer their affections from us. Yeah. You're raising them for a woman that you want them to love more than they love you. Mm -hmm. You want them to transfer their conversations that they had with you to that woman. Mm -hmm. You want to train their brain. You want to teach them how to communicate, how to talk about those things that they're processing. But knowing full well, you're doing this for her. Mm -hmm. You guys got me crying so much today. <laughs> you're doing this for her. It's, mm -hmm. it, I, I talk to moms all the time that are, they feel competitive with their daughter-in-law. They feel rejected by their son that he doesn't call as often. And he tells her everything he used to tell me. It's like, good. That's what's supposed to happen. Yeah. Yeah. And I would tell Brandon, call me on your drive home from work. Don't call me when you're at home and you need to be with your family. Call me when you're on your way home and you have a few minutes to chat. Right. But don't, I don't want to steal you away from those kids clamoring and she's been taking care of them all day long. So yeah, that I, I just, mom's raising sons to be men. It takes courage. It's not for the faint of heart and to hand them over to someone else takes bravery, yeah. but it's the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. Think of how powerful that is. Like as a mom, I've never had that thought before, but I think that's so profound of raising them so that they transfer that to their spouse, like if you think about us, like if our mother-in-law had done that for uh -huh. our husbands, which maybe they have. <laughs> uh -huh. Or maybe, right? or maybe not. But, well, yeah, I'm like realizing, but, like, oh, that explains a lot, <laughs> you know, like, what, you know, so yeah. it, it's, it's, that's powerful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. why we're all so emotional, especially when you told your story, Teresa, is like, we, we all have sons and we're all very, like, we want the best for them. Like our love is so deep for them that like that moment that you were talking about, like you never want that to leave. And the thought, like the fact is, is that is going to happen. Like there is going to be a last time where you mm -hmm. snuggle in bed with them. Mm -hmm. And that's like, oh, so how do we, how do we raise them so that we always have that relationship with right. them? You can't snuggle in bed with them. Obviously, right. <laughs> but but you still have that relationship way. where they call yeah. you on their way home from work, right. like Rhonda yeah. was just saying, and you still have that relationship that's open yeah. with them. And honestly, ladies, it's our calling that if you have been called to motherhood, there is a ministry of motherhood to which the Lord has called us. And we cannot do it without his wisdom. If he called you to deepest, darkest Africa to go and live in a hut and share the gospel and preach and do all those things that a missionary would do with the zeal and passion, you would wash your mind with the water of the word. You would seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. You would search your heart and ask him to show you your own sins so that you can pray powerfully for these people you're going to minister to. You'd go all what in. Do we do? What do we do when we find out we're pregnant? I want some cute maternity clothes. And I'm going to look on Pinterest for some cute ideas for the nursery. And we want to be the best mom that we can be. But we forget this is a ministry to which God has called us. And it's humbling. And it takes God's courage. It takes his strength and wisdom. And it is a daily battle mm. to stay in a place usable by the master for this amazing calling to be an architect of the next generation. Because that's every woman who has poured into her child. These, you know, these men in scripture, these men in history, their first teachers were not seminary professors. It was their mama. Mm -hmm. And that is an amazing, noble calling. And you need to surround yourself with other women that understand that we are called to this. It is a ministry. And we need to be warriors on a mountaintop like Moses interceding for Joshua, who was fighting a battle. When Moses got weary and his arms came down, his buddies lifted his arms up to help him keep interceding so that the battle would be won in the valley. When my kids started to act rebellious, when my kids started to spend time with a boy or a girl that I felt was not a good, you know, boyfriend to girlfriend material, my small circle of woman friends interceded with me on behalf of my child. Mm -hmm. uh, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous mama accomplishes much. And you surround yourself with some mama warriors like that. And there's no stopping what God's going to do in and through your life and through the life of your kids. I have a question. I guess my question is, where is the boundary where that connection with your son and you have that strong connection where to the point that it does affect the relationship, the marriage, the woman that he's dating and because of the strong relationship with the mom that they've had growing up, there's a point where they have to do cut that relationship. So where do you, how does that boundary work? Mm -hmm. That's an interesting question. As a mother of a son, 
we get to learn from women who've walked ahead of us, women who have lived it. That's why I wrote this book, because um, a lot of women don't have an example to even really follow. My mom was a teen mom and I was her second child uh, and she did the best she could. And she, my mom and I grew up together. I actually led my mom to the Lord six months before she passed away. It was pretty cool. But yeah, I didn't have the like, oh, I'm going to do it like my mom did it example. And let's be honest, there's so much dysfunction in our homes and in our upbringings. Uh, We end up focusing more on what we don't want to become than what we want to become. That develops resentment, that develops bitterness, that develops, uh, you know, the Bible says the man thinks in his heart, so is he. When I'm thinking about what I don't want to be like my mom, guess what I'm thinking on? Her character qualities, and I will become that exact thing I don't want to become. So Philippians says, think on what is good, right, honorable, praiseworthy. I want to surround myself with women that have walked the path ahead of me, that are willing to say, hey, this is the regret I have. I I held on too tight to my son and he pushed me away. Or this is what I learned when I handed my my son over to his manhood or when I uh, pulled myself out. So the transfer, there's a couple of of stories. Um, First of all, David's mom in the Bible. Why don't we know her name? I think the woman should have a shout out. There is no name of David's <laughs> mama in the Bible, but we'll find that out one day, but come on. Yeah, so here's point. David and he's getting ready to fight Goliath. Remember, he was probably 17 years old. And honestly, when God gets a hold of a teenager's heart, he turns the world upside down. Mm-hmm. And he went and his brothers were hiding and he told Saul, I'll fight him, I'll fight him right now. And Saul gives him his armor and he takes it off. And here's the key to what he says to Saul. God gave me victory over a lion and over a bear, I know he will give me victory over this giant. Uh-huh. Time out. He was 17. That means as a young teenager, God sent a lion and a bear into his life while he was protecting his father's sheep. Where was his mama? I would have been like, babe, a lion attacked our son today. He don't work for you no more. He's staying home. <laughs> <laughs> but she You're staying home today. Yeah, yeah every day. Life. He wasn't, she wasn't a helicopter mom. And then he was sent to the battlefield by his dad to bring lunch and provisions to his brothers. When we protect our son so well from the big bad wolf, what we not, might not realize is that God is sending the big bad wolf to pre, uh, prepare them to fight that giant. Mm-hmm. With my son Brandon's story, I got to tell you, he had severe seizure activity. He was highly medicated. He was stoned. He was on special ed at school, which those words pierced my heart when the uh, school administrator used them. He didn't want to play sports. I was coaching high school cheerleading at the time, which is a cult in and of itself. It's an awesome plot thing, but it's definitely, <laughs> it's definitely yeah. intense. Robin, but I expected my little boy to be an athlete, to hit one out of the park, to run one down the field, to hear the crowd glory in my son's accomplishments. That was what I thought my son was going to be. And he didn't want to do any of that. He played Legos. He picked up a guitar and he started every band member that came to our house would give him pointers on playing their instruments. He could play them all. But I remember going in my room one night after Brandon had a severe seizure because we missed one dose of his medicine. He took three times a day. And I wept at the foot of of my bed and I told God, I'm done. I quit. I'm out of here. Kids are coming to Jesus. We're serving you. You can't heal my boy. I'm done. But here's the secret. Psalm 119 says, God's word I've hid in my heart that I might not sin against him. His word dwells in us richly. That's what speaks to us when we're ready to walk. And I heard in a still small voice, not audible, but it shouted to my heart, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And I said, no, I can't even imagine how you can make good come of this, but I know you're good and I know your character. And I will say thank you with my lips if you change my heart. And slowly, We started watching Brandon become this amazing musician. My husband, who is also a worship pastor, and he said, "Uh, I've never met anyone who thinks in music theory like Brandon does. And slowly what we realized was God used Brandon's epilepsy to form him to be a musician. And anybody who knows stoners make good musicians, right? (laughs) (laughs) But as Brandon grew up and God gave him all kinds of opportunities, He was able to become not the one I wanted him to be. In fact, God had to get this mom out of the way because I would have raised an arrogant little athlete. 
But God said, you want to raise him so you can hear the crowd glory in your son's accomplishments. But I'm raising up your son to bring the crowd to glory in my son's accomplishments through worship. Mm. Isn't that amazing? I love God that. knew the plans he had for my son. But let's stop. I know I've been in ministry for 30 plus years. I know moms that have gotten mad when God didn't heal their child, when God didn't, you know, their husband's a jerk and he left and they're a single mom or they resent and they get mad at God because he didn't show up for them. And guess what? Your resentment renders your prayers powerless for your children. Ten years later, my daughter Meredith was living and working at the Masters University, her and her husband, and she gave birth to a little girl. We went running into the delivery room. This was after both of my daughters had had a number of miscarriages, and we were so excited to celebrate a baby. And my son-in-law stopped us and said, hang on, something's wrong with Ivy. She has something called Golden Haar Syndrome, and she has facial cranial deformities. She's absolutely adorable and precious, but she's had five surgeries in her little lifetime. But we were just like taken aback. And here's the thing I want you to catch from all of this story. My daughter, Meredith, after you know things settled, doctor's visits, learning about Golden Haar, all of those things, I said, how are you doing, honey? And she said, mama, this isn't my trial. This is Ivy's trial. And we're here to equip her to walk through this trial, trusting the Lord. Mm. Wow. Now, what if I'd walked away 10 years earlier? when Meredith, who was in junior high or high school, was watching me. What if I had said, God didn't heal my son, I'm done. Because it's sometimes our trial's not about us. Sometimes it's the lion and the bear to protect your child to fight Goliath. Mm. I'm sorry, I'm super tearful today. To fight Goliath when it's their turn. Mm. It's about it them takes- watching. Yeah, mm-hmm. we're giving wow. those examples. Now you mentioned a couple of things that struck me earlier. You said something about us handing our, our, our sons their manhood. Can, can you give me an example of what that might look like? Yes, I can. So um, I'll give a little tidbit of Tony's story, just because I think there are people watching that have a stepson who's moved in with them at 15 years old, or you're a foster mom or adoptive mom. And sometimes you think, ah, oh, they're done. It's like they've already got it imprinted on them who they're going to be, and I can't make any difference. Well, when Tony moved in with us, um, Steve instantly became his dad. Instantly, he attached to his father. Uh, I wasn't his mom. I was the woman in the house that loved him. He watched our marriage. He learned from us. But I remember I had to earn his ear. And men like to speak shoulder to shoulder, not face to face. When they're little boys, you get them, look me in the eye. I'm going to tell you something. You're going to listen. I had the best conversations with Brandon when he was learning to drive shoulder to shoulder as, and he, he was a captive audience because he had his permit and he only could drive if I was with him. <laughs> but Tony had a Jeep that he would work on and it was in Texas. It was super hot. So he'd do it at night and there was no top on the Jeep. It was a convertible. So I would sit in the Jeep and just talk to him with his head in the engine. And he talked about girls and he talked about his dream to go to A&M University. And he talked about girls. He talked about his dream to be a fighter pilot, which he grew up. He flew the F-22 Raptor. He's a lieutenant colonel in the Air Force. He talked about girls. And (laughs) I had the best conversations with him with his head down in the engine. I got to talk to him about God's, you know, my book, Real Life Romance, actually has all my kids' love stories in it. And I got to talk to him about the woman that God would have for him. And he listened. But I guarantee you, if I would have made Tony sit at my table and listen to me, I'm going to talk to you and you're going to listen. He would have out of respect done so because he was grateful to have a home to live in. Uh, That movie, The Blind Side, was Tony's story very much like that until he um, found our home. Mm. In fact, he called me when he saw the movie and he said, I just saw this movie and it reminds us of our family. And that woman reminds me of you. And I go, um, am I that obnoxious? And he goes, kind of. (laughs) I'll take it. I'll take it. (laughs) But when he was doing what men do, working on their car, he was all ears and he listened to me. And actually that works for your husband's two ladies. Go sit outside while he changes the brakes on your car. Let him do his thing and just talk to him. Anyway, with Brandon, he was, we had been going like this, like just trying like things like, well, if you if you really love me, you'd let me skateboard all over town and you wouldn't, you know, you would give me more freedom. And I'm like, that, our town is a meth town. And let me just tell you, it attacks <laughs> kids. In our, and I'm like, no, that town will eat you for lunch. And he said, um, if dad wasn't a pastor, I could do that. I'm like, if dad was still swinging a hammer, you wouldn't be skateboarding through the town because the, the Satan's a roaring lion and he wants to eat you and you don't even know it. But 
as Brandon would say things that would, you know, you don't even love me. And I'd be like, oh, okay, you love you. I just love you. you know? <laughs> and so my husband came home at one point and he's like, enough. You don't work for her anymore. You work for me. And I'm a harder taskmaster. And so then Steve told me, do not give him any chores to do. He no longer sweeps your floor. He no longer brings in your groceries. He no longer does any of the things. He works for me. And then he told Brandon, okay, we live on an, a ranch and our house about a football field away is our, a barn. He said, I want you to pick and shovel a ditch to that barn because I want to bring power over there. And then Steve, before he left for work the next morning, he said, do not remind him. Do not protect him because this is what we do as moms. Yay, dad's going to get involved. And then we're like, dude, you better do it or you're going to get in trouble. Don't you oh get in trouble? We try to protect him. And it's like, stay out of it. And so Brandon went out after he ate breakfast, didn't talk to me. And he started doing this pick and shovel thing. And the ground's super hard. And when Steve walked in the door that night, he was like, dad, I can't wait to show you what I did today. Can I have some gloves? Because I got blisters and I have to play for worship on Sunday. But come see how far I dug. And I'm going to do more tomorrow. I'm like, this is the kid that wouldn't sweep my floor. (laughs) But I found he craved affirmation from a man that said, attaboy, good job. So we need to know that when we want to step out and ask our husbands to take control, and if you're a single mom, do not tune me out because we had other men in my son's lives who also, he went to work for a man in our church so he could save up to buy a guitar. Um, You want to find godly men that are strong influences in your son's life. I have two best friends, both of them, single moms, both, both of them, their son's father committed suicide. And I'm telling you that they did the right thing. They pressed in. They went on vacation with us. They spent time with us. They exposed their children to godly marriages and they gave them heroes. Our sons are looking for heroes and it's not you, mama. It may one day come full circle and it may be you again. But right now and during adolescence, it's not you. Point out to them heroes that they can emulate, celebrate that, give them over to work that they're going to be proud of. And under the authority of a male role model, I think of Timothy in the Bible, Lois and Eunice, he was raised by a single mom and a grandma. And I know a lot of grandmas are raising their kids now, especially with all the drugs that are going on there. I have so many friends that are raising their own grandchildren because their parents are not able. But Timothy told Lois and Eunice, basically, when when I met Timmy, it was because of you and your groundwork that you had done by showing him scripture and living it out. He was ready to receive the gospel when I delivered it to him. Mm -hmm. And Timothy became his father in the faith. And he handed the very mantle of his ministry over to the son that was raised by a single mom and a grandma. I love knowing that. Uh, Tony, my, my, my husband, has been his father in the faith. We had a young man named Casey that moved in with us. He was a stand-up comedian, juggled in Austin, wanted to serve the Lord, but needed to get out of that nightclub scene. He moved in with us for only a year. And in that year, and and we're talking about the Brave Show, it takes bravery to move young men in your house. It takes courage to share your groceries and all of that is in your home with whoever God puts on your heart. Now, I'm not talking about just moving anybody in. I mean, Steve was in youth ministry for 18 years. There was a lot of kids that needed a family, that needed help. But these, these were the two young men that God impressed on us to bring them into our homes handing the baton of our ministry over to them. Casey juggles for Jesus now. He is a, um, he speaks at youth camps. He travels all over sharing the gospel to teenagers. He works in ministry. Um, It takes courage to put yourself out there, but oh, to hand the baton to the next generation. Wow. I just don't know what to say. Wow. Mm, So how did your relationship change with your son once you had your husband kind of take over the more disciplinary, you know, aspects of, of the parenting? What, what, what it happened with you guys? That's a great question. So one of the first things that happened was we were at church and my husband was in his office after youth group with a bunch of people that he was, or somebody he was counseling. I honestly don't remember. And Brandon came to me and he said, Hey, can I go to Jack in the box in the car with these teenagers? 
And I, we were very careful, 18 years of youth ministry, you watch a lot of kids die in car accidents, new drivers, carload of kids, all that. But they always had to ask permission. So Brandon, who was not yet driving, said, can I go with these kids to Jack in the Box? And I said, I, I'm not allowed to give you permission. And he said, no, dad's counseling. And I just need, I said, they're going to go right now. It's And he named the kids, they're good kids. I love these kids. I want them to be a good influence in Brandon's life. And I always want things to be fun. My kids did a personality study on me. I don't even know what it was, but my daughter said, mom, you're a yellow. You want everything to be fun. My childhood makes so much sense now. I'm like, thank you. (laughs) So I wanted him to have fun with good kids. So there was a temptation in me to say, yeah, go ahead. I'll, I'll smooth it over with your dad. But I knew that I had told Steve, I wouldn't give him permission to do anything. So I said, I'm sorry, if you go, you're going without permission. Maybe dad will say it's okay. Maybe he won't, but I can't, I'll get in trouble because I promised dad that I would not do that anymore. And so he didn't go and he was mad at me, but it was a turning point because see, our sons know they can manipulate us. They know they can make us feel all the feels for them. And they know that they can make us feel guilty if we're not doing the thing or letting them do the thing. But when they know that there is someone standing between us and them so they can't manipulate us anymore. And like I told you, Brandon said, when my mom stopped crying, I knew I had lost control over my mom. Mm -hmm. And honestly, it changed our relationship so much for the better. I was his cheerleader. I was his confidant. I was his prayer warrior. I was no longer the one that he felt like he had to rub up against to show he was a man. And it changed our relationship. And I'll tell you this, I know that there's moms listening right now that are going, oh, no, 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 you don't understand. My husband would let him do anything. I know I have to be the one in control. I hear you. I hear you. And if you don't do this, you may think this is better. And maybe it is. But for me, my son needed me out of the way so he could be a man that I could celebrate. And then having conversations about, I know the man you want to be. We're here to help you get there. One of the conversations that Brandon and I had, he was driving. We live up a a 45 minute winding canyon in the mountains. Like there's literally a cliff on one side and I'm driving with a 15 year old with hormonal imbalances and all of that. (laughs) And, And Brandon was asking the question, why don't you guys let me listen to secular music? Now, I'm not a pro or not pro secular music. I mean, I love me some good 70s rock and roll. That was that was when music was music, people. (laughs) But and my other daughter listened to secular music as long as the lyrics were not, you know, um, destructive. But for Brandon, music touched him so deeply. And I remember we were driving and he wasn't we weren't arguing and, and we were just discussing. And I said, dude, here's the thing. And his nickname is dude. Uh, I said, here's the thing. When you were little, your seizures are what God used to turn you into this amazing musician for Christ. And the Bible says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. If you feast on secular music and the words of the world that are set to music, that's what's going to come out of you. And you have shared with us, and we believe that God wants to raise you up to be a worship pastor. And we're here to help you get there. And we're here to help you set a guard over your heart until you're old enough, wise enough, mature enough to do it yourself. And he got real quiet. And later, as an adult, he said, I hated that conversation, but I loved that conversation because you made me think. And there's a section in Moms Raising Sons called Train His Brain. It's easy to just say no, because I said so, because we're Christians and we don't do that. And what will people think? And which that's a whole other section called People Pleasing Isn't Pleasing. But (laughs) instead, we have to say, I have a vision of this amazing man that you want to be and that I think God wants you to be. I am here to help you get there. And I don't want you on my couch when you're 40 years old playing video games. I want to launch you at 18 years old into your dream. I want to be here, but Satan is a roaring lion. He wants to eat you for lunch. And until you see the battle for what it is, dad and I are here to help you set a guard over your heart. And if you're a single mom, that same conversation, I'm here to help you set a guard over your heart. And I'm praying for you to have God's wisdom and discernment. I don't want Satan to steal, kill, and destroy the dreams I know that God has for you, mm-hmm. but I'm here to help you get there. Wow. I guess I have a question because that was absolutely beautiful, but I think the single mom keep coming to my mind as you speak of, about single moms. When they don't have that relationship with their son and then there's not that father figure that can step in, I think we can see by statistic that it does affect the son. So how... 
do you see, like how do you help that relationship when there's a single mom that's working all the time and can't give that attention to the son? Mm -hmm. Good question. Well, first of all, we have to not create and, and do what is called emotional incest with our son. Because what happens oftentimes, not even just with single moms, I know a lot of pastor's wives that dump on their kids all the frustrations they have over their husband's work mm. as a pastor. Emotional incest is when we pour out our emotions onto our child instead of our spouse or instead of a counselor or a friend, and they're not equipped to handle it. Mm. And with moms who've had sons, you know, husbands that are a drug addict or who went, left them, their family for somebody else, when we try to point out the bad character qualities of our sons, I mean, of our son's father, so that they don't become that, we are still breeding resentment in their heart. We are still focusing on the negative, thinking it's going to help them not become that. And when they hit adolescence and they're looking for heroes, even if their dad is dead and committed suicide, you become the enemy and you're tarnishing my father's memory or my father's reputation. I want to believe the best about my dad. Instead, we have to, number one, with our own hearts, Lord, this man did me wrong. This man is the worst father on the planet. But I want to forgive him because I don't want him to have power over me or over my son. And I know that my sin of unforgiveness ties me to this person because love and hatred is very similar emotion in that it ties us to a person. And then if we can just say, Lord, either judge that man or save that man. I don't care. It's not my business. He's in your hands. We can walk away and be free. And our sons can do the same if they see it lived out in us. Jesus said the student becomes like his teacher, not like the teacher teaches and preaches, like his example. So for a single mom, I have to tell you, you have to be part of a good, godly Christian community. My husband was a youth pastor for 18 years. He was the father in the faith to so many of the young men that came to our youth group. And those single moms, those aunts that were raising a son because their mom was a drug addict, grandmother, they would go to my husband. They would go to the youth workers that, that their son connected with or their daughter connected with. And they would say, you know, he's really disrespecting me or he's really struggling with this. Or, and my husband would step in and be like, hey, buddy, that's your mom. And you're not going to treat your mom that way. And I'm here to step in for your mom and you're going to show her respect. We find other godly people that will step up and be the male role model and even our protector from our son treating us in a way that's not appropriate. Does that make sense? Does that help? Yeah, it does. You know, a couple of things that you said earlier struck me too um, that I think is a just a shift in how we think and when we talk to our sons. One was when you were correcting your son about, or not correcting, but teaching him about the music thing. What you did, what I noticed that you did was instead of giving the reason why you did things to keep him a child or to protect him as a child, you shifted the language to instead build up who he's going to be instead. Mm -hmm. So I'm doing this not to keep you here, but to take you there. Absolutely. And then the other thing I noticed that you, you mentioned was when um, talking about with them about certain character traits that you want them to have or not, instead of focusing the language on this is who I don't want you to be, mm -hmm. instead shifting the language to this is who you want to be, who you want to be, and so yeah. I'm helping you get to there. So I, I, it's like a totally different way of thinking about how to even correct. I don't know if the word is correct, but mm -hmm. like disciple or build up. Guide. Or, Guide. guide. There you go. I well, like that word. That reminds well, me of a quote from your book. I loved it. It says, remember that some of the best teachable moments come in times of disobedience. Absolutely. Right. And honestly, that's the thing that why the book doesn't just say mom's raising sons, but it says to be men. Uh, tell yourself every day, I'm raising a man, giving them the glimpse of the man that you hope they'll become the man you want to instill. When Brandon was five and he was being harsh with his little sister, Kayla, I'm like, dude, I can't let you talk to Kayla like that or you're going to grow up and be harsh to your wife. Yeah. When you grab Kayla's arm because you're frustrated with her, you're going to do that to your children one day because it's who you are, who you will be. And it's going to be familiar to Kayla. 
and she's going to gravitate toward a man who's harsh or who will grab her arm. And then his little chest popped out to protect Kayla. Like, whoa, that ain't happening. Um, the, the, the most important aspect of this whole book is not forgetting we're raising a man and helping them recall My goal is not to keep you, my little boy, the rest of my life. That's not good for you. It's not good for me. My goal is to help you be the man God wants you to be, because I know that in that you will be so fulfilled and joyful and have no regrets. Uh, Let's talk about talking to our son about sex. Can we do that? Yeah. So when Brandon was in fifth grade, I remember that he stayed home from school one day. And he asked me, are we running out of time? Do I have time to oh, tell no. this? No, please. No, no, we're excited. Okay. We all sat up. That's what Vanessa's like. Everybody like perked <laughs> up. I know. What are you? It's a good topic. We're like, we all have to teach right. that in the next five days. Yeah. <laughs> COVID cough. Oh. Anyway. So Brandon stayed home from school one day and he it was just he and I. And he said, hey, mom, you know, they're going to have that talk at school about sex and I want you to tell me about it. And I'm like, oh, you know what? Dad's going to talk to you about that. I talk to the girls about it. Dad talks to the boys about it. Dad's going to talk to you about that. And Brandon kept pressing me. And he said, I want to know. And here's the thing. We're talking about the Brave talk show. It takes courage to talk to your kids about sex Uh and not just to say, uh, just don't do it until you get married. Like, And that's honestly, I'm going to plug this book too. (laughs) Real Life Romance is all about redemption for people that had sex before marriage and what it cost them, but how God redeemed their romance. And then it also celebrates those that walked in obedience to the Lord um, and, and walked in purity until they got married. And can I say this? Eh, maybe I'm not saying it. I'm revealing too much about my kids. <laughs> anyway, so uh, Brandon said, I just want to know. And I said, okay. So I went into a junior high school teacher biological definition of what sex and intercourse is. And always mom, when you're telling it, tell use the words when a husband and wife have sex, don't say man and woman, husband and wife, you're imprinting on them. God's plan for sex inside of marriage is for a husband and wife to enjoy the marriage bed. So that's a, a little buzzword that is makes sense in their head that that's how God ordained it. So a husband and wife, when they come together, and I explained all the ins and outs, <laughs> ins and outs. <laughs> no <pun intended>. Literally. <laughs> and when I was done, I was real proud of myself. And Brandon, I'm like, do you understand? And he's like, I do. Can I ask you another question? And I said, sure. He said, why did so-and-so get pregnant then when she wasn't married? It was someone in our youth group. If she wasn't married and it was just to make babies, why wouldn't she wait till she was married to make a baby? And I'm like, dang it, you're going to have to talk about that. (laughs) So then I went into talking about the pleasure of intercourse and how, you know, God makes man's body to enjoy it this way, and he makes woman's body to enjoy it that way. And I'm going to also plug my book, A Christian Woman's Guide to Great Sex and Marriage, short, sweet, tells you how to have great sex. Anyway. Oh, yeah. So, So Brandon, I explained, you know, all of that. And I said, but let me tell you something, dude. Here's the thing. Women want to be in love with a man that they give their body to. And women think if I give my body to him, that is a sign that I want to be his forever. And so they're thinking he'll love me forever if I give him my body. Men want to conquer women. And for the most part, they will pursue her until she puts out and then they move on. And a godly man might pursue her, but if he's a believer and she's a believer, all of a sudden she's the object of his sin. And the person that he adored, much like Absalom in the Bible when he he resented Tamar after he raped her, the person he adored now represents his weakness, his sin. And he may keep going back and having sex with her. He may even marry her to make it right because he feels so guilty, but it's not God's plan for marriage. So we talked about the all of that. And I remember explaining to Brandon how it's a covenant. And this is an interesting thing. And a lot of people don't understand this. The sign of a covenant, if you go back and you study in the Old Testament, the signs of the covenant, when God had a covenant with Abraham, he said, separate this flesh, walk between the pieces. I'm going to walk between the pieces, cutting of the cutting of the flesh, walking between the pieces represents my covenant with you, the lifelong covenant. When Jesus said uh, for the communion, you know, the breaking of the bread, the, and the, this is my body. 
do this in remembrance of me, the flesh, the passing through this flesh, the blood that covers us is what makes us in a covenant with Christ. Uh, believing about Jesus and who he is, is not true salvation. And I got to be honest, I'm an evangelist at heart. You cannot do any of this stuff and make a difference if you don't have a relationship, a genuine relationship with who Jesus is. So that, if you message me, I'll send you how to have a relationship with Christ because that's the priority of life. So as I'm explaining to Brandon, here's the key. Intercourse is a sign of our covenant. It is a passing through the flesh of the husband to the wife. And as he inserts himself into her body, it's a sign of their covenant. It's a remembrance of their covenant. And honestly, ladies, that's why when you don't put out for two or three weeks or a month, uh, you're not remembering your covenant. Just like just Jesus said, this do in remembrance of me when we take of the Lord's Supper. This covenant that we have with our spouse, intercourse, is a sign. It's, it's what first consummates our marriage. And it's a sign of our covenant. And I'll go so far to say that's also why um, sodomy is a mockery of Satan, because it mocks the good sign of the marriage covenant that God gave us. So as I explained all that to my fifth grade son, and I can tell you, it takes courage. It takes bravery to talk about these things with your little boy whose eyes are just as big as saucers. But this is the brave (laughs) show. So be brave. Yes. And all of it was done. And we were talking and I said, you know, Brandon, there's a woman that God has for you. And I want you to be able to look at her and say, I saved myself for you. And I want you to pray for her, that God will help her save herself for you. So he said, yeah. So we knelt at the side of my bed. I said, let's pray. I prayed. And then Brandon prayed. And he said, dear God, thank you for sex. And I pray that you help me to save myself for my wife. And I pray that you help her to save herself for me. And God answered that prayer. And then Brandon said this, 10-year-old fifth grade Brandon said, and God, please help my sisters not to be tricked by any men and help them to save themselves for their husbands. Amen. He got it. Isn't that the sweetest? Now, my husband could have had the sex talk with him, and he did. When Steve got home, I'm like, babe, I had to talk with dude. It's your turn. (laughs) And I tapped out, and to this day, I don't know what they talked about. (laughs) But handing them their manhood, what kind of a man do you want to be? Do you want to be a man that manipulates women to get them to put out? Or do you want to be a man that honors women and helps them protect themselves from you by not pressing them to have sex? Wow. I love Love that. that. Yeah. You know, my son, um, the oldest one that I was just talking to about earlier, um, he he is, I, I had him out of wedlock. Um, so uh, it's that whole story is really interesting, but we've had to have this, you know, sex conversation as well. Um, and you know, he knows firsthand why I tell him, like, I want you to, to save yourself because he's, he's seen the damage of what, what happens when you don't like that relationship didn't, didn't come together. We didn't get married. And now he has to bounce back and forth between these two families. And if it were, if it was, we had approached it the right way, you know, the chances of that having happened would have, would have not. And so, but I also tell him how even this, because I don't want him to feel like, um, I came out of this thing that was, that was wrong and and then him carry that Mm -hmm. shame. Right. So Mm -hmm. I also shared with him the beautiful thing that happened with that. Like I was, and I, I've, I haven't given you guys a whole lot of details, but like I lived pretty wildly ladies, uh, from 16 to 26, I've done some things. I've done some things. Um, and I, um, I, when I got pregnant, I had a, I had a long-term boyfriend, you know, um, and so that kind of calmed me down. But there were still a lot of things that I was doing. You know, we were kind of drinking a lot, a lot of parties and stuff like that. But when I got pregnant with Canaan, there was something that, that changed in me. Um, and that began my own change, my own like mm-hmm. transformation into um, becoming a Christian and um, changing my whole life, leaving that life that I had lived that was just so wild. Um, and so I tell him, I said, God, God used you. God mm-hmm. used you to, mm-hmm. to change my life for the good, you mm-hmm. know? Um, and so I, I see a little bit of like a, okay, you know? in his eyes when he hears that. And I, I hope that in a sense that for him, that even though there is this, this brokenness that came from that, that he sees that beauty and that hopefully that redeems it in some way. Mm-hmm. You know, Absolutely. Way. I, you know what? I celebrate my mom's courage. My mom was a teen mom. Like she had to drop out of the 
drill team in high school to have me. And I feel very uh, connected with teen moms, with young moms that uh, get pregnant and have their babies. My heart, I wrote an article for Focus on the Family. It's called uh, Confessions of a Teen Abortion Accomplice. I was the accomplice. Uh, Abortion is something that some women are watching even right now and going, oh, you know, if God only knew or if you only knew. And what I love is when God redeems, he redeems to the utmost. I love David and Bathsheba's story. David had an affair with Bathsheba. She got pregnant. He sent Uriah to die in battle to cover his sin. He took her into his home, married her. They covered their sin for a year. He pretended to be a godly king. And then when he finally repented, David, Nathan came and said, you're the man. And he wept. But he said, that's when he finally repented that then he said, and now I can teach sinners your way. Now I can worship you. And we're all walking our path. We all have regrets. And when I talk about building a no regrets life, it's not just never making a mistake. It's living in a way that those regretful things that God redeems them and uses them. Teresa, your story gives hope to another mom that's listening right now. Having us try to pretend like we're perfect and we never have done anything that we have regrets over, that's not what that's about. It's about not letting regrets keep us stuck. David's example, when his son Absalom raped Tamar, his daughter, David did nothing about it. He shut his mouth, basically said, Tamar, just hush, just hush, girl. David had his own skeletons in his closet of his own immorality And because of that, he didn't think, oh, and I don't know, this is my own creative license. He didn't have the authority as a dad to say, don't, don't do that because he had done that. Right. But we cannot let our kids suffer. I hear parents say, well, they're not doing as bad as I did at that age. Guiding and guarding our kids so that they can live the life without regrets that serves and follows Christ is not based on my own regretful past. I have wisdom and discernment that I will gladly share But I know that the path my sons and my daughters have taken is not because I've lived well or perfectly. It's because I've lived genuinely. I've asked their forgiveness when I need to ask their forgiveness. Uh, And I have not set a bubble around them. You read a quote from the book earlier, and I I feel like I need to go backtrack a little back and talk about that. Uh, We're not trying to raise perfect kids. We're trying to raise kids that know how to recover from their mistakes. Mm -hmm. And if we keep them in a perfect home with no opportunity to make wrong decisions, they won't know how to repent. They won't know how you will handle it. So when they're out on their own, living a life or making decisions or sleeping with their boyfriend or, you know, I've got to go have an abortion because my mom would die if she even knew I was pregnant. All of those things, if you don't have them live in your home and know, hey, we all sin, mom sins. I was just on the phone gossiping about that lady. I need to call her back and ask forgiveness. I need to ask you guys forgiveness because mom, the, the normal Christian life is we try, we fail, we repent, we ask forgiveness, we move on. That needs to be lived out on a regular basis with our kids. And when my son-in-law was a RD at a master's university in Southern California, he said the kids that were in their little homeschool bubbles, and I'm not bashing homeschooling. I came back to California in 2000 and homeschooled my youngest two because the schools where we live were so bad. I wept because I didn't want to homeschool. I wanted to go coffee with my friends. I didn't want to stay home. (laughs) But... Uh, these kids that were in their bubble would come to a Christian university with full scholarships because they were so smart and could pass those SATs with their eyes closed. They would cut class and they would play their roommates video games all night long. They would look at porn on the internet. And we should probably talk about that if we have time. And they would, they didn't know how to set a guard. They didn't know how to discipline themselves or self uh, motivate themselves because they'd always had a mom keeping them, in a bubble. And so there's a, again, it calls for wisdom to know what to let them be exposed to and what to not. And the Bible talks about if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. (laughs) Funny story. I remember when Brandon was coming, he came home from college and we were watching TV and a Victoria's Secret commercial came on and he started laughing. I go, what? And he goes, when I see those commercials, I hear your voice in my head. Brandon, those women carry diseases. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) And I'm not saying a Victoria's Secret model carries diseases. I'm just saying. That's just what he hears in his head. (laughs) 
my boys but, have been taught just look away, just turn yeah, on your head. Yeah, yeah that's, what uh, they, yeah. that's what my boys do. I feel like I've learned so much just like about giving the confidence. Like my husband and I always talk about, he's always like, you're too overprotective. Like here's one example. We, my 10 year old, he's now 11, was in a ski club this last winter where all of like the neighbors that had fifth grade boys because Utah does a ski pass, um, the parents would take them once a week, they would skip school and they'd go skiing at a different resort each week. And the parents would take turns taking them. And I took them one week and the next week it was somebody else's turn to take them. And I got nervous because the weather was really bad and my son was starting to do black diamonds. And I like got a ton of anxiety that I'm like, what if these other boys leave him? Like, what if he's on the mountain by himself? Like, what if he takes a new trail? What if he does this black diamond and he can't get down? What if it's like extra icy? Like my mind just started racing with all of these things that I'm like, what if, what if, what if, what if? And so I told my son before he left, I'm like, if the weather's bad, <laughs> if you get nervous, just don't do it, okay? Just stay safe, stay with the buddies, like don't do anything if you don't feel comfortable with it. Like I'm pep talking him, right? And my husband looks at me and he's like, no, you do double black diamonds. He's like, you push yourself out of your comfort zone. You go for it. Like you follow those other boys and where they go, you lead them off those double blacks. And I was like, no, no, what are you doing? And he looks at me like, shuts me up with this look. And I'm like, <laughs> so as soon as my son left, we had this talk where my husband's like, Brittany, he needs to push himself. Like you can't be there all the time for him. And we can't have you telling him to be safe. Yeah. Like, yes, tell him to be smart, but don't tell him to always play it safe. Like he's got to have room to spread his wings and fly. And I was like, oh, I guess that's why he needs a dad. Like, yeah. Yeah. because I, I, our advice was opposite. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Kyle went and he had the best time and he did black diamonds and he had fun with his friends. And like, I totally would have ruined that experience for him if he had followed my advice. I think that's why I'm hearing here, like, I love the mother. Like, my sons are, like, literally, like, they still snuggle with me, and I love it. And I know it said it's going to end, but I'm like, I don't see mine ending because my kids are so loving. Yeah. But sometimes, like, I'm that mom, too. Like, I don't, my husband actually does different. He's always like, you so hard because I feel like, is it too much sometime? to be overbearing. That's why I was like, is, is it too much? Because I'm just like, with mine, I'm like, Ben, I'm like, nope, you do this, you da da da, you stand up, like I'm teaching, and I do it with a loving, but I feel like I don't want to be overbearing, you know, where it's just like, you mama's boy, like I want my kids to be mama's boy, but at the same time, I'm just like, no dude. Kick him in the pants. Exactly, you get punched, <laughs> you're gonna punch back. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know, so. Well, and then I wonder, yeah. you know, we, we, we're living right now in this society um, where there's a lot of, of boys without fathers yeah and we're seeing the results and one of the things i remember reading a statistic somewhere that um i don't remember what it, it was a significant number i don't 70 80 90 percent of high. men in prisons came from single house single mom households mm. now i don't think there's anything wrong with the moms i don't think like you did it you know yeah. it but it is an interesting statistic about like what what happened that these these what happens when you don't have these strong men men in your life that are teaching you and we're doing the best we can yeah. as moms but we only think like women yeah and that's and we don't know how to, to bring think up in the other ways that's the black community majority of home or single mom home and that mom is also working three or four jobs to provide for that son so they don't have the support of a you know that good man in the home and plus now they don't have mom accessible to them and then the cycle that we see in our community is they probably will end up in jail also because they don't have that strong root in the home mm. so that i know the black community that's something that happens way often than most yeah. so my friend pam farrell she's the author of men are like waffles women are like spaghetti her and her husband we're having she her on in august yep oh, she's good. coming on in august Released a single mom's book. I was going to say, you got to talk to her and Peggy right. Sue Wells. It's, I think it's called The Best Decision a Single Mom Can Make or something, but oh, that would be a great resource. Yeah. Awesome. Wow. Well, thank you, well, Rhonda, thank so much you. for coming on. We'd love to My have you. Pleasure. We'd love to have you come back um, because you've written so many books and we know that you have wisdom also in marriage and so forth. And we'd love to have you come back and share with us, share with us more of your wisdom on that side of the family, too. Um, we know, we talked about this before that, um, earlier before this episode that, you know, 
we, we know that the family is that microcosm uh, that is just foundational for our kids to learn everything. And I think that they're looking at our marriages too. Um, and our marriages are an example to them for how they're going to do their marriages and so forth. So we'd love to have you back to just give us some ways to help us out in our marriages so that we can be better examples to our sons and our daughters and so forth. Um, so if you're open to that, let's have you back on. Absolutely. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much. I would love you. to. All right. That would be great. Uh, you guys are awesome. I love your show. I love what you're doing. I love that it's brave. I love that it's courageous. I love that you're talking about things a lot of people don't want to talk about. Mm. I mean, we could do a whole episode on hormonal imbalances and postpartum. That was a dark season in my life. And I think a lot of people don't know what really is involved with that. So uh, yeah, anything, anything you girls need, I'm here for you. Awesome. So how can our audience follow you? If you go to my website, noregretswoman.com, and if you sign up for my newsletter, that's uh, that helps me because I'm trying to get another book contract, and they look at your newsletter signups even more than they look at social media numbers now. Um, so if you could sign up for my newsletter, you'll get the free chapter that's not included in our marriage book. It's called The Money Myth, More Money Means Less Stress. And also, all of my social media tabs are there. But I want to invite you this summer, if you get the audio book of Moms Raising Sons to Be Men, you can also read the paperback. But I'm doing a free online book club on Facebook. I go live every Wednesday to talk about a chapter. And we're just reading the chapter together. And then I talk, we comment, we're supporting each other. Actually, honestly, it's the most amazing. It's 400 women in there. My sister passed away this week. And that's the only group I'm on social media that I've shared it with yet because I feel like it's a good, safe community. Uh, so, yeah, it's um, go on Facebook and it's uh, Moms Raising Sons Book Club, I think is what it's called. You have to ask to be let in. Give me your email address. I'll put it on my newsletter, but I'll also um, email you when I go live every Wednesday. All of my, there's focus on the family interviews, family life today. Um, Dr. James Dobson, who I adore, his interviews are on there. Lots of free resources. And if you want to follow me on Instagram, Rhonda Stoppy, R-H-O-N-D-A, because my mom was a teenage Beach Boys fan. <laughs> Rhonda Stoppy, S-T-O-P-P-E. And I will, I hang out on Instagram a lot. Oh, All right. right. Thank well, we're you. Instagrammers over here too. They're teaching me. They were in yeah. time. I, I had to transfer over, but I'm loving it. And I'm actually on it now more than I am on Facebook. So thank you for joining our Brave Conversations. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe to our channel and hit that bell notification so that you don't miss our next episode. We're going to have a lot of other amazing guests. Are you ready for more? Click on the next video for more Brave Conversations. Have some brave topics you'd like us to discuss? Leave your suggestions below. We'd love to hear from you. See, See you, you next, next week. week. Hey, brave girl, how you